welcome to the last panel before drinks. Uh, it's just pointed out. And I hate the last guy before drinks too, so I'll try to be quick. Um, yeah, the curious case of open government in the works. Um, so the Nordics are kind of notorious for being well governed. Uh, they often see as leaders of the pack. This is from the Economist article. Uh, praising trust in institutions, that there's lots of this kind of thing out there. So, when the Nordics joined the OGP, which I'm trusting most people are familiar with, and, and by the way, that's uh, excluding Iceland, um, there was a lot of uh, expectation that they would lead the pack. Um, as it were, the, the Nordics were universally criticized for, for poor quality of consultations, uh, poor ownership and coordination, and uh, poor commitments. Um, one commentator went so far as to describe it as a Nordic race to the bottom. Um, and, and so this is a, is, is a curious thing. So this is about research to explore why that is. Um, firstly, uh, the question is, are the Nordics actually competitive? Um, and that's not as, as, as simple as it might seem, because a lot of the data and a lot of the criticism they received was in the form of narrative uh, evaluation reports, which are really hard to compare across countries. Um, uh, I have not taken the time to read all of the country's reports. But what we do know is that the quality of the, of the commitments in the national action plans are notably worse than other countries. And we know that the Nordics think of themselves as being very different. Here we have this interesting equation between the Nordic model of government and the Norwegian model of government. Similar uh, articulations are present in government documents from all the Nordic countries when they describe their activity in the OGP. There's a presumption that uh, the Nordics did open first. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, they're, they're different. Um, secondly, is that a problem? Um, it really depends who you ask. Civil society in the Nordic countries think it is. Uh, universally, there are criticisms that the government could be more open. A lot of that goes for financial transparency, beneficial ownership, and by then uh, reporting, uh, the way uh, access to information laws and freedom of information laws are, are implemented. So there's a lot of room for uh, improvement. Um, but there's also just this mismatch of expectations. This is one quote from interviews. Uh, this is a government official talking about what OGP asks them to do. And here again, you see the presumption that we are already so open this just feels like an onerous reporting process, uh, and it's really getting in the way of doing open government. So this is, uh, this is academic research, so I'm just going to real quickly bore you with a couple of academic slides before we ask what can be done. Because trying to figure out what it means and how to tweak the policy for open government, uh, that, that's kind of the, the mission for this research. Um, so the research question is, how do domestic factors influence the way that open government norms get interpreted in country? And this is something we've known for a long time, ever since human rights uh, uh, advocacy research, is that you know, these global norms get uh, lauded and debated and they get advanced in the global arena, then uh, advocacy actors in country bring them home and argue for them, and they often get adopted through uh, a variety of complex mechanisms, but they always get translated, they always get tweaked a little bit in light of uh, national factors. So this was trying to figure out how that happens in the context of the Nordics. Um, it's building on theory, a lot of the human rights research here, which tells us that, that OGP should work. The OGP model, the, the, the theory of change for OGP, adheres really closely to what the, the scholarship says about uh, norm promotion on the international stage. You have something that's validated internationally, you get political leadership to sign up for it, and then you open up a space in country where people can argue about what it means, and that should lead to norm adoption. <clears throat> it also tells us uh, how context matters, primarily in the sense of uh, the domestic salience of international norms and political discourse, you know, how, how significant is open as a thing in political discourse, and, and domestic structures. How do laws and administrative uh, institutions uh, align? And then secondly, there's a whole host of, of literature on policy, policy diffusion, policy transfer, and policy translation that really looks at how policies move across countries and the processes that shape them. And a lot of this is in the context of the EU. And then the last boring academic slide is on methods. So this is largely using uh, documents from governments and from the OGP, and then based on the number of interviews. Most of these are in Norway. Uh, Norway was the most extreme case, uh, so that's where most of uh, the research is done. But there's a handful of interviews in all the other countries as well. It uses process tracing, 
which uh, is not just you know a fancy way to describe what happened, even though it is just a fancy way to describe what happened. Uh, it's, it's a fairly rigorous process, and then it's Bayesian inspired uh, causal causality test that can be uh, mathematically modeled to try and figure out what actually caused this. So. Um, on the basis of this, what we know happened is that uh, OGP was pitched and framed in the first instance as a way to hang out with Obama, because he was so cool. Um, and we see that it was framed to political leadership as an ambassadorial uh, event. It wasn't framed as something that would lead to changes in implementation in Norway. It was framed as an opportunity for Norway to tell the rest of the world how open Norway is. It was framed as an opportunity for Denmark and Sweden to show how open the Nordic model government actually is. Um, now, what, what happened, interestingly, after that is as it moved down from the uh, prime minister's offices into the foreign ministries, into the line ministries, and eventually into the agencies for implementation, um, it was institutionalized in all of the Nordic countries into existing fora. Um, and most of the time, that happened in uh, foreign uh, uh, financial transparency uh, working groups and things like that. And so it was given to people who did not have expertise for what OGP was expected to do, which deteriorated the amount of knowledge and the amount of contact they had with the international norms. Um, this led to a general lack of awareness. If you go out to civil society in any of the uh, Nordic countries now and ask them about OGP, they will scratch their heads. Nobody knows what it is. If you talk to the people who are in charge of implementing OGP in government, many of them don't know what OGP is. Almost none of them will be able to explain what OGP is for or what it's intended to do. As a consequence of this, nobody sees the value of it. If you ask them, uh, if you ask civil society why they don't use OGP to advocate for their favorite issues around government openness, they will tell you, but that's just a middleman. I already have the ear of the newspaper and the ear of the people who make the political decisions. So there's no clear value in that public discourse. Nobody sees a reason to engage. <clears throat> As a consequence, OGP has led to almost nothing. In my 30 interviews, uh, I have only found three people who were able to uh, articulate a change that has come from OGP, and none of them were able to provide evidence of it. Um, and that's particularly challenging when we think about the cost. I mean, we, we heard about uh, you know, uh, how we want to measure outputs and inputs uh, together, and there's been a very significant cost uh, invested in this. Uh, not only in the form of uh, finances and uh, dues paid to the OGP, but in time spent, uh, not in the least in reporting. Um, however, there is a consistent reference to some very, very slight influence on institutional cultures. Uh, repeatedly within some agencies, uh, government workers tell me that open has become a word that gets used that it never was before. Mm -hmm. Now they feel as though they are able to advance their pet projects by referring to, well, we're part of this open international thing, so it makes sense, doesn't it? Um, and, and there's a, a small bit of salience that has been allowed, even in this context. So reflecting on why it happened, how it worked, uh, these mechanisms that are predicted uh, by the literature were all meaningful. There are institutional incentives to you know, do your daily work, to, to proceed with what you're doing, and to report on OGP as necessary, but not to do anything else. Um, the idea that uh, Norway is all, and, and Sweden and Denmark are all leaders in open government and should share their experiences with the world is prevalent and presumed across the board. Um, and, and public discourse <laughs> simply did not happen. In most countries, there was one, two, maybe three uh, op-eds written in newspapers, and that was the extent of media coverage. Um, these factors moderated significantly. Lack of precision is particularly important. We talked a lot about this uh, this morning following Jonathan Fox's uh, keynote. Um, and the ambiguity of open government, I think, is worth recalling here. It's also worth recalling that this was a deliberate strategic decision. This is a feature of open government as it's conceived as an international norm. Uh, when the OGP was put together, there was a conscious decision to frame it as a big tent concept that would attract as many people as possible. And you know, we're paying for that in some ways now uh, in that open government can mean so many different things to so many different people. Same with open data. It means one thing in the startup community. It means another thing to the business community, to the uh, advocates, and on and on. And that can frustrate expectations. It can make it challenging to measure uh, outputs and impact. But it's a price to pay for a very deliberate decision. In the case of Norway, it means that everybody uh, I spoke to was able to say, yes, we're implementing the OGP. We're so open. 
right? It, it doesn't, it doesn't lay out very specific things. There's a lot of research, incidentally, that shows how much more effective international normative mechanisms are in influencing state behavior when they use rankings and hard numbers. Um, there's a specific phenomenon called a commensuration. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's been demonstrated pretty convincingly that if you stick a number on an assessment of governance performance, it, it significantly motivates uh, social, social uh, pressure inside of institutions and across institutions. UDP doesn't do that, and so it's particularly poorly su suited to, to the North context. Um, lack of political support. Um, this, is, this is a key aspect of the OGP theory of change. They always get the uh, political leadership to sign on. But uh, in the Nordic countries, once political leadership signed on, it was never mentioned again. This was consistently cited as a reason why it wasn't pursued. And then lastly, this is also something uh, that was predicted by a lot of more recent uh, literature on policy translation. Um, lack of go-betweens. Go-betweens are people who uh, move information between the people who are supposed to be implementing policy uh, at, the, at the micro level and the international policy entrepreneurs. Um, and this was very limited in the North cases, and it proved to be very effective in promoting an understanding of open government when it did occur. So last slide, what does it mean? It means that framing matters. That initial framing uh, being an ambassadorial uh, uh, mechanism, uh, that persisted uh, as information about the OGP was disseminated across institutional structures in all four countries. Um, it, it mattered, and it, it was so effective in this dissemination, at least in part because it, was, it resonated with the presumption that Norway was already so good. Um, rankings matter. Um, all of the uh, government uh, representatives I spoke to mentioned uh, how much harder they work on their open government uh, performance in regard to OECD evaluations, um, because there they are compared and ranked and they feel as though they get much clearer guidance on what they should do to get there. Um, Go-betweens. One of the most interesting things I found is that in each country, um, as information was sent down the line from the uh, prime minister's office through the ministries, um, information about what OGP actually was uh, became less prevalent. Um, and then after the first uh, action plan was reviewed and, and they got criticism, uh, information about OGP increased significantly in the focal points offices. But after that, that information never disseminated, except for the people that they work with on a daily basis. And so knowledge about OGP, uh, interest in collaborating with civil society on developing action plans, interest in learning from international uh, uh, activities was always much stronger in the institutional agencies that worked with the OGP focal points anyway, even if it was never framed as that. And the interesting thing is when they talk about uh, institutional cultural changes, this is outside the sphere of OGP policy. And so because I happen to have an office across the guy, across the hall from the guy who's the focal point for OGP, I don't feel necessarily more motivated to do my reporting differently on OGP, but I use open as a idea. I use it as a concept to advance work that I already want to do. Um, I think there was one more. Yeah, and so the potential for spillovers. Um, in, in another piece of research that I'm not uh, presenting here, there's significant evidence that uh, participation in OGP has a very modest but statistically significant effect on e-participation and collaborative decision making um, outside of OGP policy areas. And so I think what this suggests is that there is a certain uh, equilibrium towards the status quo that is affected by things like uh, institutional incentives and ideas, and that there are opportunities for that to be disturbed by new ideas and by public discourse and debate over what you know, popular broad norms mean, but that has to happen and can be effectuated through go-betweens at specific points in diffusion inside of institutions. Uh, otherwise, uh, the institutions that I've looked at where democratic structures are very well established and where there's common knowledge that we are already doing all the democratic things, it will revert to the mean every time, unless it's disturbed. So this is one of the few uh, instances in which I think disruption is a useful word. Um, and that, that's something the OGP and other international mechanisms should be actively designing with their civil society and counterparts in country. Um, how am I on time? <coughs> Okay, then I'd love to ask a question in this couple of minutes. Because the big question for me here, I, I, I find this super interesting uh, about the North, but the question is what does it mean for other countries, right? Um, 
I, I'm tempted to think that because the relationship to other mechanisms is so different, and because these phenomena are present in other you know, established democracies, that it might resonate in other countries. But I would love to hear from, from those of you who do country-level work whether or not this resonates, whether or not you've seen similar demand, uh, dynamics when, when institutions are adapting global norms or not. If anybody has a comment on, on whether or not they've seen that, I'd love to hear it. Yes? Um, from a sort of partial perspective, the UK does resonate a lot. I think they have some similarities, apart from the kickoff as well. Mm. I, the, I guess the thing that additionally struck me, and I think it's true of some of the audits, is the lack of political support is also <coughs> quite significantly a feature of a change of government. Or even if it was a change of political party, a change of key leaders, the political leaders in that, and a lot of traction disappearing because it was so little individuals. Um, and I think at least in a couple of audits, that's the elements of that same dynamic. So it's part of your moderating factor, but it's quite specific kind of designing the change of government or changes in individuals in other positions into those. Yeah, one other interesting I think that ties into that quite well is there was a change of government in Norway, and when the new government came in, there was no support from the first government who had actually signed up for it, and when the new government came in, they saw a strategic opportunity to use OGP to advance their modernization uh, agenda, which we see this a lot in OGP context. It often gets framed as modernization or digitization or you know, making government more effective, um, and so that was pushed hard by the new government. But what it meant is that less people knew what OGP was, and they just referred to it according to the, the National Action Plan for Modernization. And they reported, <laughs> when they did the IRM report, they just referenced the Action Plan for Modernization. <laughs> I guess I'm less put on the level of the OGP label and how to stick, but whether the process triggers something. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Blair? Yeah, Blair from Gaspers. I have a related question back to you, actually. Maybe it was beyond the scope of the research, but. Uh, is having an audit as part of AGP in any way helping other countries do things that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do within the AGP framework? I mean, a lot, a lot of AGP is about peer learning and sharing. Did they, you know, were there in aspirational terms? Was there anything that happened elsewhere? Or was there some capacity building that, the that happened? <laughs> no, in other countries. Yeah, yeah, no, the Nordics think so, that they've been very helpful in yeah. helping other countries. Yeah. Um, there, there have been a, no, a number of meetings where the Nordics have been asked to, to proselytize, as it were. So uh, some, some government officials have told me how important the Nordic uh, presentation was for getting France to join. Uh, I, I haven't confirmed that with France. Um, and there is a, there's an ongoing working group between the Nordics plus, uh, plus Estonia and Latvia, I think. Um, and they say that you know they, it's been really helpful for them to learn from from the Nordics, but there's not a lot of evidence beyond that. Okay, um, if you would like oh, to yeah. Fair enough. Absolutely. Um, yeah. 